Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Sokka here, and welcome to a brand new series called Crusader Kings 2, tutorial for absolute beginners. And this tutorial is aimed for people who want to get into the grand strategy, maybe pick this up on a sale, maybe saw gameplay and was interested, or those of you that have purchased it and was completely confused, I'm going to try to do a basic gameplay uh, so you can get a feel of what's going on. So what is Crusader Kings 2? It is a grand strategy game by Paradox Interactive that can simulate a medieval family through uh, the medieval ages. Now unlike a standard grand strategy game where you're looking out for a country, this game you're looking out for a family and increasing a family's name and prestige. So let's go ahead and get going. We are going to do a single player and I've got the... Uh, the Vikings enabled, but we aren't going to start back there because um, if you don't have any DLC purchase, then you will start here at 1066 in the High Middle Ages. We're going to do a custom game setup because uh, we can learn on Newbie Island. Ireland over here is known as Newbie Island because um, they're not really affected in the early game by a lot of the politics that are going on in mainland Europe. So, as with most uh, Paradox games, there are different map modes. We can see terrain, we can see realms, so you can see uh, how big, say, the Holy Roman Empire is versus these realms down here, which are basic single realms, which will aid our expansion. There is also the Counts, so these are people that are of a Count rank or higher. Duke, so these are the Duke ranks or higher. King, so the King of England, the King of France or West Francia, and then um, higher than the King is the Emperor and the Holy Roman Emperor um, and the like. We also have a religious map mode, so as you can see, predominantly Catholic over here with some other uh, Muslim religions over here and Buddhist, Tengri, all of those good things. But in the base game, you can only play as a Catholic nation, so we will stick with one of those. You can see the culture groups as very important in uh, Paradox games to make sure that everyone is the correct culture and the government type. So most of this is a feudal government type um, which fits right into the gameplay. So let's go ahead and look at the realms here and you know what? Let's take a look around here. Okay, so we have a duke here. We have a single count here single count here you know what let's just start as Ubrain. sure the king merchant of Munster with one vassal he does have a count under him and uh, this should be pretty good for a learning experience so we will click play and you will be greeted with the game rules you can tailor any one of these to fit your play style I will just go with the uh, the tried and true um, stock game but you know you can you play with these as you will we'll go ahead and start a game and get the basic menus down in this episode we probably aren't even going to hit the play button as there is a lot to talk about before we even get going so the game will load up and we will be greeted with our family we have the basic welcome menu and what does it mean to be Irish Catholic? You have all of your rules and regulations here. So, we are at 15 September 1066, and we have the paradox pop-ups that need to be dealt with quickly. And we also have, uh, so a left click on our portrait can reveal who we are. This star means this is the character we are currently playing as. This is our heir. We do have a son. We also have one deceased half-sister and a, two half-brothers that are still alive and well. So let's get started here. Let's take a look and see what titles we own. We own the Petty Kingdom of Munster and the County of Thoman. So we own two, uh, two plots of, well, we own one title with one plot of land that we directly control. If we click on this, we see highlighted here what lands do we own. So this fits with our vassal that we have here, who is also our steward. He is ruler of the county of Ormond. So we 
as our king merchant of Mus Munster, we live here at Thoman, and this guy over here in Orman answers to us, and that's why this dashed line surrounds these two, and that's why this is a different shade of green. We do not have a wife, so one of the pop-ups here is ruler is unmarried, and we can fix that quick, fast, and in a hurry. We also have an unmarried heir, and as this is a family sort of simulator, we want to make sure that we are producing legitimate children and that our heirs are producing legitimate children as well, because if you die and the heir is not of your dynasty, the Ubrain dynasty, the game is over. So you want to make sure that you have plenty of family at your disposal. Let's take a look at this first pop-up here, the council. Shortcut F3. These are the people that are closest to us, and you can see the green numbers here are their relationship to us out of 100. It can go to negative 100 or positive 100 as far as the calculations are concerned. You can certainly go below 100 and certainly above 100, but it will only show from negative or red 100 to green 100. You want to keep these people happy. You want to keep them um, respectful of you because if someone out here in the world, let's say, wanted to plot to kill us, then these would be the people that would be talked to and if they don't like us, they may join that plot to kill us. Now, each position can do three separate jobs. The Chancellor can improve diplomatic relations and you see the possible outcomes and these are based on a yearly role. Meaning that December 31st comes around, you're not going to roll, you're not going to flip a coin essentially. This is calculated by the day. So you can essentially divide the 51% by 365 days a year to get your daily chance that we improve relations with that Lord. And there's also a 4% yearly chance that we actually do damage and sabotage relations. So as we maintain good relations, if we want our vassal here, to really like us, who is sitting at a 54, we may send our chancellor over to talk nice to him, to say how awesome we are as a ruler, but then again, our chancellor may screw it up, and then he, uh, he says something wrong and we aren't looked at fondly. We can also fabricate claims. So claims are absolutely necessary to go to war and to expand. You can expand by inheritance, so say if the county of Desmond, if we had a family member in here, or if we were an heir along the list and we wanted to inherit that way, we certainly could try. But if our family is not here and we wanted to take it over, we will need a claim on this plot of land. Claims can be fabricated through the Chancellor, which has a 15% chance yearly. We can infuriate the noble. He can catch us trying to fabricate um, our name on his land, which will infuriate him and obviously not be successful. But if this claim is successful, we can spend money and prestige, basically take a, um, a personal hit to our character to say, yeah, matter of fact, we do claim this land. Since this is a one province miner and he does not have a lord, we will go to war directly with him. He has two vassals in his city that can provide a levy as well. And he has base 1,100 troops, which can help us sort of gauge how strong he is if we were to move. Also, our chancellor can sow dissent. So if you want people in, say, this court to not like their liege, if we look at his court, he's got 12 people we can influence. If we send our chancellor over to his court, they are going to be... Uh, lied to essentially and told what a terrible guy this guy is which can make him easier to plot against if he doesn't have friends living near him so that is the chancellor's actions this is um the stats of this guy in this particular category chancellor so if we do take a look at this guy these are his base stats and every character does have their base stats and the uh, positions here you want the highest of course number in their respective position. The Marshal is our troop trainer, our levy raiser. This guy is your head general, let's say, or someone who is commanding your troops. We can suppress revolts, so if there is a revolt risk, if bad things happen, 
If people get ticked off at us, our marshal can suppress those revolts. We can also train troops, which is probably the stock action for the marshal most of the time because it increases our levy size and our reinforcement rate for when we do go to war, which is very, very powerful. We can also research military tech, which we will get to the tech tab shortly. Our steward is our tax collector. Uh, the better he is, the more, the higher chance he has at collecting more taxes and collecting that tithe. Um, so just as he sits in our capital collecting taxes, we will gain 30% more funds, 30% uh, more ducats. Uh, however, there is an 8% chance that he can collect more money and the population is okay with it, and a 3% chance that the population is going to get upset with him, possibly beat him, possibly kill him, because he's trying to squeeze every last bit of money out of them. He can also oversee construction. So as we build up our realm uh, buildings, we can place our steward there to speed it up uh, by 30%. If he meets a bastard builder, a 6% chance that uh, build time will be increased dramatically. Although if he also can uh, has a chance of sabotaging the construction, setting it back, and researching economy tech if there's no money to collect or no construction to do, but I don't really click that button. Your spy master is in charge of all of your backstabby, your um, trying to get rid of your opponents in a clandestine and underhanded manner. So the more skill he has in intrigue, the better chance he has of discovering plots against you. So everybody here on this map, you know, is working against someone. They are doing the exact same things that we are doing, so it would help to know if anyone is plotting to get rid of us. Say, if we tick off our vassal and he wants to become the duke, or the king in this case, and overthrow us, our spy master is going to be responsible in discovering that. He has a 32% chance of uncovering a plot. This may not be a plot against us, but also someone in our court, say our wife, our children, things like that nature. He can also build a spy network, which will inc increase plot power, and we will get to plot uh, in the Intrigue tab, but this makes it easier to kill our opponent underhandedly. We can also spread vicious rumors, meaning that people really don't like our target, and it's, of course, easier to get people to join our cause, but if we are discovered, then, of course, the plot um, fizzles out, and we are known as an underhanded backstabbing fool. And we can study technology. So if there is no plots against you, which is rare, and you don't have a spy network to build, you can research technology. Our court chaplain is down here. He can proselytize, so this is how you can convert counties once you take um, different religious groups. But up here is really Catholic. So until if we expand down here, that's when we really have to worry about proselytizing. So we can do other things like researching cultural tech or improving religious relations, which is very powerful, and I will explain why here in a moment. So these are the people that you need to watch. Always have them doing a job. Keep them happy. We have minor titles that we can assign for our realm. The regent is who will take over if we become infirm, if we are unable to rule, or if we go away on, say, pilgrimage or on a trip uh, to Rome or Jerusalem or a holy site. The, the, the regent will be in charge. So we want to pick a regent who really, really likes us and who will do what we want him to do. So that's something to keep in mind. We also have the commanders. So as we raise levies, um, these men can each lead a division. And once we get into war, you will be able to see that. We can see there are modifiers here. So some commanders will have a better chance of leading the center, some commanders will have a better chance leading the flank, some commanders are scaredy cats and you don't want them. This guy is a cavalry leader, so he gets a plus 20% for mounted troops, which is pretty powerful if we have a cavalry-based division. So that is the first tab in the council, basically who is doing jobs for us. We now have the laws, and these are the gender laws, and the succession laws. We have to rule for 10 years before uh, we can change any of these, but this changes how inheritance is done. Right now, we are agnatic, cognatic, gavel kind. 
which means that the titles are divided amongst the children. So right now, because we have one child and he is our heir, he will receive everything that we have. He will get the petty kingdom of Munster and he will get the county of Thoman. If we were to have another child, that would then split. So the oldest child would get the, the, the kingdom or the dukedom, but our second child may get the county of Thoman and we would have two vassals, let's say. So if you can change your laws, if you're the, the, the type that want to not give up any of your land, something like the elective monarchy may be good as all things are passed down. However, this will really upset the children because they no longer have a claim in your, upon your death. There are a lot of different um, laws and you can mouse over each one of these and get a tooltip to say what would be the best course of action. Agnatic, cognatic is okay. It's, it goes to the sons first or the men of your family first. And if there are no eligible men, then women can inherit. We can also go absolute cognatic, which means that the oldest woman would inherit before the oldest male. And of course that would upset the, the males saying that their sisters can inherit before them. And agnatic upsets all of your daughters because only males can inherit. So pretty powerful stuff. These are your realm laws. So centralization, if you wanted to increase uh, your domain and vassal limit, these are the way to go. Um, but and we will cover that uh, here in a moment. Obligations, so your uh, vassals can provide troops in a time of war. This basically says how many of those troops, a percentage, will they give you as far as the levies go. Also taxation is here, so if you want the, say, the churches to give a higher tax, this is where you can pick that law and you can see the effects. So we get 45% more taxes from this, but that upsets our church vassals. So we do have some church vassals here at the bishopric. This guy, Bishop Kolb of Kilohoe, this will go down by minus 10 because, you know, we, uh, we're taxing the crap out of them. So be very careful. We want these guys to like us, these, these mayors who are directly under us because if they don't, they can join a plot to kill us. So it's a very delicate balancing act, money versus respect, let's say. This is our technology tab. Uh, unlike um, EU4 or other grand strategy games, um, technology is sort of spread um, by, by touch. You can see the areas of high tech versus the areas of low tech that spread sort of dynamically. Your advisors can help that spread a little bit. But to be honest, I don't really touch the technology tab until I have a pop up here with gears that says, hey, you can get technology. So we'll, we'll cover that in the playthrough when that comes around. So military is where we raise our armies. And this top number here from Domain, these are troops that we own, that we can raise up at a moment's notice. So these troops come from our holding. So right here, we own this castle ourselves. We have 1155 troops that we can raise at a moment's notice. These belong to vassals, so these 446 and these 641 are not at our disposal without clicking the From Vassals tab. Now these vassals have to like us and get a positive opinion to give our, you know, this percentage of their troops. So Ringwald in the county of Orman, our vassal here can give us um, at most 641 troops. Uh, and they can give us 43% because of our laws. If we want him to give more at a moment's notice, we have to change our laws. Now, this is a very interesting here. Our bishop is not giving us any troops. Why? Well, if we look at his opinion in the religion tab, we see that the bishop likes the pope more than he likes the ruler. So all of his tax money and all of his armies essentially go to the pope. Now, he doesn't like the Pope all that much. One little bribe here and there, and we can influence him to pay us. But if you look at your military tab and you see zeros, you wonder, hey, what's going on with this bishopric? Take a look at the religion tab and see how they like the Pope. You can also do some things like if your 
court chaplain is not your bishop, but in this case he, he is. But if this court chaplain was not the bishop of Thoman, then we could send him to improve religious relations and talk to that bishop here and say, hey, your liege is a pretty awesome guy. You should like him more than the Pope. So what we can do is actually send our court chaplain to the Pope and, you know, have him talk about uh, the Pope. And, and like us, we can also give him like a little bribe, but that is where that goes. So we have 1139 troops we can raise immediately with these personal levies. If we wanted to move down to Desmond, this is a pretty heads up fight. We may need our vassals to, to pitch in here if we were to, um, to go to war. Mercenaries are also an option. So these are the guys that are hired instantly. Um, they take a few days to regenerate, um, but they ha are 4,500 troops instantly, essentially. Important to look at the initial price costs of these uh, mercenaries, as well as their monthly costs. So for 4,500 troops, that is really, really expensive. You don't wanna hire mercenaries for long wars. As you can see, the cheapest for 1,500 extra troops, it's 150 gold out of pocket and 11 gold each month. So, you know, we're looking at 200 gold for a five month war and we've only got 64. So mercenaries are sort of a last resort. You can build up your foo money uh, in case of a rainy day, which is not a bad plan, but you know, take, take a look and see what you can do with your armies first, of course. The next tab we have is the intrigue tab. This is where we can plot to kill people. Um, so if we wanted to off the Count of Desmond, which wouldn't make much sense to do unless, say, his heir really liked us a whole lot more than his liege does, but they don't. But this is where we can click to choose a plot. It gives us some plots that the game thinks may be important, but that doesn't stop us from, say, going to any person, clicking this button, and trying to kill them. So based on the intrigue, we have plot power. So if we wanted to kill Fair Tareth MacDonald, our plot power essentially starting is 41.2%. The possible plot power is 99.9, .9, and where that number is coming from is he's got enemies near him that would love to see him disappear. So if we were to start this plot and invite people, we could get almost 100% assurity that a uh, an event will fire. Not necessarily that he's 100% guaranteed a uh, chance to die, but 100% chance that the plot will fire as long as there is one backer. Any plot can fire as long as it has a backer, but say like this, we could try to kill Sound Una Flowen. We only have 18% chance to start. We do have a backer that would join, but there's only a 27% chance that the plot would even fire to begin with. So that's not a good plot. If there are people in your court, let's say, that really does not like you, you sort by opinion and you see, like say these guys, which is your son. You can't kill your kids. There's no valid plot against children. They patch that out. But say like these co this courtier who doesn't like you and you wanna get rid of him, he's got a 52% chance of an attempt being made on his life. Plots work all the way up to say the king of West or the emperor, the king of West Francia, yeah, King Philip of France. Yeah, we can try to take him out. We do have a little bit of power. So this is where thinking about royal marriages come in. If we were to have a daughter or to be betrothed to King Philip of France and he accepts that, you know, this then you know, our family can be on the throne. We can usher in our family to this place. And then all of a sudden, this little Duke of Munster may be in charge of West Francia, which is pretty awesome. Plots are very powerful. However, keep in mind that people could be plotting to kill you as well. That's where this spy master will come into play. Down here, we have actions that we can do. We can promote a commander. If you have no one in your council that has good numbers, you can do that from here. Invite nobles, holy men, you know, things like that to get some people with some good stats into your court. We can hold a feast, summer fairs, grand hunts, buy indulgence for your sins. You can see what the conditions are when you hover over these. And if you can't, 
if they're grayed out, you can see why you can't hold a summer fair. Well, we lack the, uh, it'll cost 25 gold. It'll gain us prestige, but the month is before August, which needs to be uh, checked. So it's kind of backwards. The month is before August is not true, which means the month is not before August. It's September. But we could go on a grand hunt, etc., etc. If there are threats in your realm, say that a vassal is getting very powerful, they want your title, they are going to do a civil war, their threats will appear down here. If you capture prisoners in war from sieging down holdings or capturing generals in battle, they will appear here. If your spy master has discovered a plot against you, they will be here and you can act accordingly. Looking at the factions, so the factions are, say, if our vassal wanted independence or he wanted to form, you will see so-and-so wants independence, you will see his backers. In the plot in the faction to make them strong and how much of a percentage threat they are of actually enacting that faction the religion tab based on our Catholic faith we see the current sitting Pope and we see our vassal bishops that we directly control and their opinion of us versus the bishop so that is the main meat and potatoes tab over here we can see our religion our government type our ambitions, which we'll get to when we close off these modifiers, our personal stats, and the state diplomacy, which is sort of how the world sees us, that is based also on our chancellor's skills as well. And once we get a wife, her skills will add half of her skills to this total as well. We can see our traits, so we have a personal combat skill of one with no modifiers, so we are not leading an army anytime soon. We are a tough soldier and those are the perks that they bring. We are just, we are diligent, we are humble, and we are stubborn. And these are character traits that are embedded in the character. Events may fire that can change these. And these that are numbered and green, these are virtues. And the opposite numbers, which will be red, will be the equivalent sin. So humble would be proud, so sin would be a red seven, and that would overwrite this good virtue with the sin and affect our numbers accordingly. We can see some basic uh, modifiers here such as the domain size. We can see how many plots of land we own versus the total we can hold personally. We see how many vassals we have as our total. How many troops we can raise in our total levy at one time. How much gold is in the bank. How much prestige that we have and how much piety which we can also see over here our wealth and our monthly balance per month and and that changes we can see our prestige and why so we're getting because we hold a county a duchy a barony and a, a vassal barony and county we have a little bit and from technology as well the higher this number goes the more favorably characters from all around the world will see you you will see your prestige here in the personal opinions of others we also see our vassal limit and our domain size we also see um, our realm size, how big, how many holdings we have in our realm, and our score for the game, which is just sort of an ancillary number to see how we stack up. So that is basic menus of Crusader Kings 2. When we come back, we will deal with these um, alerts and possibly unpause the game and start to fabricate on Desmond. We can move south as I do not believe he has any packs. He doesn't have an alliance. If we declare war, no one is going to come to his aid. So that is where we're going to go from here. Um, as we play, I will play very slow, and I will explain all of my decisions as we go, and hopefully some of these uh, pop-ups will, will come into play, and I can explain those better. But that is going to do it for me in this episode, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that I was able to explain this uh, clearly. If not, feel free to ask questions in the comments below. And if it's a question that will be covered in gameplay, I will tell you to, to hold fast, we'll get to it. But that's gonna do it for me. Ladies and gentlemen, like, share, and subscribe if you are so bold. Thank you so much for tuning in. And look for me in part two, where we deal with these and unpause the game. Take care.